Welcome to another ABC Radio National podcast. For more information, go to abc.net.au slash rn. Are we hearing enough diversity of opinion from Australia's Jewish community about the Middle East or are alternative voices being stifled? Hello, I'm Paul Barclay and this is Australia Talks on ABC Radio National, Radio Australia and online. And if you believe a statement released by 120 Jewish Australians, alternative voices from within that community are silenced, labelled disloyal and self-hating. The fallout has also generated discussion around Jewish identity and representation. So while the debate plays out in the letters pages, the editorial columns and blogs in the Jewish and non-Jewish media, we're going to try and fill in some of the middle ground of the issue and put it into an historical context. And as always, we value your contribution. Do you think we hear enough diversity of Jewish voices speaking about the issues in the Middle East? If you're part of Australia's Jewish community, do you think that this sort of debate is constructive and are the processes in place to handle dissent or perhaps you think it's a storm in a teacup or have a comment about the way the media is covering the story we'd love your views 1300 22 55 76 or if you prefer 1300 call rn that's 1300 22 55 76 or 1300 call rn call now from south australia and the northern territory and uh, to uh, Briefly uh, recap, a group known as the Independent Australian Jewish Voices recently published a statement of principles, a call for an alternative view, which touched on a number of issues but concluded on this note. We call upon fellow Jews to join us in supporting free debate to further the prospects of peace, security and human rights in the Middle East. The statement talked about an urgent need to hear alternative voices on the topic, the implication being that these voices are not being currently heard. Their statement follows on from similar statements from Germany and more recently Britain, where the likes of Harold Pinter and Stephen Fry voiced similar concerns. Well, the Australian statement has certainly generated a lot of heat from uh, within Australia's 120,000 strong Jewish community. Does the issue represent a significant schism within that community or is it just part of Judaism's long traditions of vigorous debate? Take two Jews and get three opinions, ran a headline on the letters page of the Age newspaper this week. Well, representing the group Independent Australian Jewish Voices is Peter Slezak, and Peter is a senior lecturer in the School of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of New South Wales, and Anthony Lowenstein. Anthony is a journalist and commentator and author of the uh, Fair to Say controversial book, My Israel Question, and uh, welcome to you both. Um, Anthony, to you first of all, can you clarify what the statement actually says without, uh, in fact, reading it word for word? What are you essentially saying? Of course. The, I guess the idea behind the statement was twofold, and we were very much influenced by the British group, which launched roughly a month ago in the UK and generated a great deal of interest around the issues of Jewish identity in Israel. Our aims, in some ways, were twofold. Firstly, to say that as a Jewish community, there's not just one opinion on, on Israel. In other words, there is a perception both within the Jewish and non-Jewish communities that all Jews speak with one voice on Israel and agree with the Israel right or wrong mentality. That was the first point. And the second point, um, which is equally important, was the fact that many Jews, in fact a growing number of Jews, both in Australia and overseas, are feeling increasingly disillusioned with Israeli policies, both within Israel and the occupied territories itself. And therefore we felt that Israel's position internationally has never been more isolated. And if the current policies continue, supported rather blindly by the US and most many Western nations, Israel's long-term security and safety is indeed in jeopardy. I would have thought, though, that, Anthony, there's plenty of debate about those matters. But w- w- what you're suggesting is that within the Jewish community, it's not permissible for Jews to have... Uh, the sorts of opinions that uh, you, for one, have. Is that right? I'm not suggesting none of us. I mean, obviously, I I can't speak for the entire group, but I can simply say I should also just point out that although we launched on Monday with 120 signatures, we've now got close to 400, so the numbers have really increased in the last literally two days. But I guess the the point is we're saying... We're not saying that we're being silenced. We we aren't. We're being forced into submission. It's not about that. Our point simply is that within the Jewish community, 
any number of Jews who have written to us, spoken to us, written to us both in the last days and for me in the last couple of years say that if they speak out, if they criticise Israel, critique Israel both within their families or elsewhere, they are labelled anti-Semitic, self-hating, evil, etc, etc, even to the point where a few days ago a supposedly um, rational woman in Melbourne accused me on the Australian Jewish News website of being like David Irving, the Holocaust denier, but just not as intelligent. In other words, the point is there's a sentiment of intimidation that exists out there. No one's saying, and I'm not saying I'm being silenced, I get published regularly in the media and can talk about it. The point is that there are many, many Jews out there And indeed, it would be fair to say that the Jewish establishment and the Zionist organisations which claim to speak for all Jews, in fact, do not. They speak for a certain perception that's out there and they exist for sure. But there are many Jews, I would argue a majority of Jews, who have no voice, who don't necessarily um, get represented. And indeed, there was a recent study that was released which talked about the fact that, um, let me just read this out to you briefly, that the uh, continuity report from the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies uh, recently uh, discovered that only 40% of affiliated Jews in New South Wales are actually uh, connected with that organisation. The logical connection with that, therefore, is that 60% are not. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that every one of those 60% agrees with what we're doing. I'm sure they don't. Mm. But the point is that there is a perception out there within the Jewish community and there's a great deal of fear and intimidation. I mean, for example, I've received death threats. I get hate mail all the time from Jews. And for many other fellow Jews, they feel intimidated and they've told us this to actually speak out about this issue. Yes, and I should point out uh, this is Australia Talks and we do welcome a diversity of views on this topic and so no matter where you stand, uh, we'd love to hear from you, particularly if you are a member of the Jewish community and have been following this debate. We'd love your views regardless of where you sit on this issue, 1300 22 55 76 or 1300 call our end. I'd like to bring Peter Slezak into the discussion from the University of New South Wales. Peter, how would you characterise the people who have signed the statement along with you? Well, look, it's very hard to say. We've got 400 signatures just about and um, we sort of don't know each other and even the few signatories that are prominent ones will probably have different views. I think what's important is that uh, regardless of the differences among us, uh, there's clearly some very important uh, uh, common ground. The uh, statement that we've published is interesting because it states really quite uh, uh, um, moral truisms, platitudes, that we uh, want even-handedness, which means acknowledging not just Israel's rights but the Palestinians' rights, and we condemn violence not only uh, by the Palestinians and the so-called terrorism but also Israel's violence. What's interesting about this is that that's regarded by many people as some kind of bias and evidence of our evil, and uh, one person in an email even complained about the, 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 the horrors of this kind of moral equivalence This is very revealing about what we share uh, as principles, which one would have thought were uh, uncontroversial, and what the hysteria that's been generated by what are really moral platitudes. Now, the the responses in the press today by some of the Jewish uh, community's leaders interestingly acknowledge that these are motherhood statements, so one wonders what is the excitement about. This Mm. is an interesting question. Because your declaration refers to an urgent need to hear alternative voices that should not be silenced by being labelled disloyal or self-hating. I wonder who you're actually addressing that criticism at. Well, look, it's hardly a secret, maybe to people outside the Jewish community, but anybody in the Jewish community will know, and it's disingenuous of them to deny, that the greatest sin, which I've been warned about repeatedly from Jewish friends, is to air our dirty linen in public. In fact, I can give you a very dramatic example, which uh, uh, comes to mind always. Um, The recent Lebanon war is just one example where emails were circulating, uh, discouraging uh, criticism. But I'm very vividly uh, aware of, for example, in the 1982 uh, war when Israel was indiscriminately shelling Beirut, most people don't know that the death toll there was something like 20,000 uh, innocent civilians and, and the community leaders explicitly were warning Jews not to criticise because the claim is it incites anti-Semitism. This is the standard uh, uh, way to try to uh, shut up um, external criticism and, and while it's allegedly all right to argue, uh, as it were, among ourselves, the claim, which I think is false and actually dangerous, is to suggest that by speaking out publicly we are somehow encouraging anti-Semitism. Now, my view is that it's the opposite, but in answer to your question, this is uh, uh, overwhelmingly the, the kind of attitude that is widespread in the community. Within families, some members of the same family don't talk to each other. There's that kind of uh, uh, strong feeling. So anybody who suggests that there's no uh, bar or no uh, inhibition on speaking out uh, really just doesn't know what everybody in the Jewish community knows perfectly well. 
My guests on Australia Talks today are Peter Slezak and Anthony Lowenstein, uh, representing a group of 120 Jewish Australians calling for a greater diversity of voices engaging in the debate about Israel and Palestine. We'd love your views on 1322 55 76 uh, about this debate and we'll hear some different voices uh, on the program very shortly, in, including uh, Davia Abramovich, who uh, has a different position to uh, Peter and Anthony. But uh, let's hear what you've got to say, and let's go first of all to Stephen in Melbourne. Hello, Stephen. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering where all these threats come from. I mean, I've been saying quite a few... I've been um, harshly critical of Israel on a number of occasions... And no one's ever threatened me. No one's ever called me self-hating. No one's ever told me to shut up. Uh, no one's ever said anything. Mm. So I'm, I'm really wondering uh, where all this alleged hatred, hate, hate mail, threats, uh, telling people to shut up is coming from. So you feel absolutely free to express your views on these uh, political issues without having your, uh, can I say, Jewishness uh, questioned? Not only do I feel free to do so, I have done so on many occasions. Thanks, Stephen. Let's go... Oh, sorry? Public, I might add. Mm. No, thanks for your call. Appreciate it. Let's go... Uh, let's, in fact, stay in Melbourne and hear from David next. Hi, David. Uh, good evening. Uh, G'day. Uh, contrary to the uh, last caller, um, I'm a parent of, of uh, a couple of kids who belong to one of the Jewish youth organisations that actually signed the online petition as an organisation, and they came under immediate threat from the Zionist Federation that they would be expelled and silenced, having all their money and support withdrawn from their organisation. And which organisation was this? This is the mainstream Jewish uh, youth organisation. The, the, and where does it get its funding from? Well, it gets funding and support from the Zionist Federation of Australia, uh, which is a uh, publicly fund a Jewish body. And you're saying that that body has threatened to disband and uh, de and discontinue funding to it because it's signed up to that petition? Exactly. And, 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 of, and of course, if, if that's not um, an attempt to silence people's voices, what is? Hmm. Thanks, David, in Melbourne, and if uh, anybody from that organisation would like to respond to that claim of David's, we'd certainly welcome your views. So let's go to Margot in Brisbane now. Hi, Margot. Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about this, the, the subject of the, of the suppression of dissenting views. I did a master's thesis last year. It was conducted in Sydney with Jewish peace activists in 2004, and... Of all the peace activists that I interviewed, they all had experienced some form of silencing. And now this could go from the extreme of, of hate mail and uh, abusive phone calls to, at one end uh, to more high profile people to the uh, milder type of silencing where people know what the story is, afraid of being called self-hating, and they will tend to silence or censor themselves. So mm. people will choose where they say what they're saying, what, what they want to say. So it's going on at all... It was going on in 2004 at all sorts of levels. Um, so I, I wonder, is, is it any different, though, to any of us getting involved in a passionate debate about uh, international affairs or, or issues that are important to our heart, uh, being involved in that debate and some uh, rather vigorous exchanges taking place? Or are you saying that there's something particular to this debate and particular to the, the Jewish groups that makes it uh, more vitriolic? Well, my feeling about that is that simply to be a Jew and to be accused of being self-hating is a very, very effective silencer. Just that alone. People, uh, if you know about Jewish identity, the importance of Jewish identity given the history of, of we Jews, that is a very, very powerful weapon. And if that's used, that's almost as bad as the hate mail, I think. Uh, and I think it does have that strong emotional gut thing, the, just simply because it, it's, it is a Jewish community thing. Mm. Uh, a lot of the people I interviewed were not 
heavily involved in the community some were uh, and they had a different story which came out the same way that they were being silenced in different ways but you know some amazing thing happened one particular person who was something of a journalist got called to the Israeli consul general and got lectured on something she wrote that she thought was extremely even-handed mm. and things like that or you know somebody getting a more ho high profile person having yep. a, a, an abusive phone call and being told that it would have been better if she'd burnt in the concentration camp gas ovens mm, terrible like look that. i'll leave it there margo thanks for your views i'd like to bring into the discussion now on australia talks davia abramovich the director of the center for jewish history and culture and the uh, jan randa senior uh, lecturer in hebrew language and literature at the university of melbourne now there's a mouthful davia welcome to the program Thank you very much. Uh, Devere, the Australian uh, Association of Jewish Studies issued a statement offering uh, another perspective uh, on this statement. Uh, I'm just wondering what your counter-argument is to uh, the views that we heard earlier from uh, Peter Slezak and Anthony Lowenstein. Uh, may I also point out that I'm the president of the Australian Association of Jewish Studies. And sure. I have to say that I'm quite surprised by some of the claims that are made uh, by the IJZ about their voices not being heard. I can't accept the proposition that uh, Jews who disagree with the policies of the Israeli government are silenced by the rest of the community or that their voices are drowned out. You know, it's quite disconcerting and quite uncomfortable for me to hear the claim that there is some kind of conspiratorial, no secretive machinery in the Jewish community that has its tentacles spread out and is shutting and muzzling people up really makes me feel uncomfortable because I can't find any factual support anywhere for the contention that voices critical of Israel are receiving insufficient attention in the media. Let me give you uh, one example. Really, this is not the story of David taking on Goliath, quite the contrary. Many of the people who've signed uh, the IJV hold prominent positions. They're intellectuals who enjoy free and unfettered access to the public sphere. I mean, there's no Jewish watchdog telling anyone what to say. And I'm sure that Mr. Lowenstein would not make the claim that he's absent from the media. Now, he has a book that was reviewed widely. He has his own blog. He has many opinion pages and letters published in the popular press, not some underground paper. He's been interviewed on radio and national TV. He's given numerous talks. He's probably more exposed in the public and national media than any elected Jewish Australian leader. I mean, does that sound like someone who's being silenced and who's being denied access to the media to put his point across? Um, mm. You know, he's probably a telephone call away from getting an op-ed piece in the Australian of the age. So really, uh, we at the Australian Association of Jewish Studies would argue very, very strongly there is no lack of communal space to espouse alternative views. Uh, we've been holding conferences, academic conferences, and I sh I'll point out that the Australian Association of Jewish Studies is the only professional body in Australia which is dedicated to uh, Jewish studies and Israel. And we've held conferences for 20 years. We've had lecturers from across the world. We've never silenced or censored anyone. We convened the conferences. We've had recently somebody from... Um, uh, Bangladesh, who gave a, a wonderful talk. We've just been contacted for somebody from Uzbekistan who would like to write for the journal. And I'm sure that if Mr. Lowenstein, if he was an academic, he probably would have been able to submit a paper and we would have accepted it if it accorded with professional scholarly standards. And the via that the, the community in general deals with dissent and alternative viewpoints well? Absolutely. Uh, uh, one of the things that I would say is that I've never seen one concrete example. It's very easy to talk about death threats and a few emails, but this is really uh, to indict an entire community. I mean, I don't know Mr. Lowenstein. He doesn't know me personally. To indict a whole community because of the actions of a few is uh, tremendously unfair. And I have to say, I've not seen one concrete example in the 20 years that I've been involved in the Jewish community or evidence that shows anyone in the Jewish community leadership the democratically elected representative body stopping anyone from putting their views across. Uh, Australian organized jury does not stifle views. It simply argues about them or against them. But to accuse someone who disagrees with you of trying to silence them just because they're exercising their own right of free speech is really intolerant. And to take a different view is not to silence anybody. So 
uh, if Mr. Lowenstein or anybody else who signed uh, this petition is met by a reasoned, sensible argument, this is not vilification, this is not intimidation, it's called democracy, it's called pluralism. Uh, um, Anthony Lowenstein, perhaps you'd like to respond to what De Vere has just said? Anthony was pointing to me. Can I take that up? Uh, sure. Up or, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, let me say something. Partly this on. is Peter, Peter Slezak. Peter yeah, go ahead, Peter. Um, let me say a couple of things. I'm pleased to hear that David's so in favour of democracy and openness. Um, I think he's uh, not being entirely uh, ingenuous. When it comes to the uh, suppression, or at least the, the discouragement of, of open speech, let me give you a couple of examples. And, and Anthony, uh, let me speak on behalf of him and his example. What happens all around the world, and not just here, is that people who manage to stick their head up and say something uncomfortable and very critical of Israel get their head chopped off. And Anthony's been an example of, of uh, getting vilified in the press. If he was the only case, one might think that this was an aberration. But the fact is that every prominent person who comes out and makes a bit of a splash and says something that is very, very critical of Israel uh, gets the same treatment. And I can mention uh, a handful of people uh, who are the most prominent. For example, in the United States, where it's an absolutely systematic plague, you get people that are distinguished academics that are reviled, like uh, Noam Chomsky in particular. You get people like Norman Finkelstein who are saying extremely uncomfortable things. And people like no uh, Noam Chomsky Chomsky are attacked by the, the great celebrity uh, um, uh, Alan Dershowitz uh, on the basis of lies and vilification and defamation, which are easily shown, but most of the Jewish community doesn't bother to check. These lies, are, I mean, are just easily to, to, to show our lies about him being a Holocaust denier, stuff like that, which is really quite appalling. Now, it's not an accident that these leading figures are so vilified because it's a warning to everybody else. Uh, if you manage to become prominent. So the idea that there's no uh, um, influence or no kind of discouragement of criticism is just disingenuous. It's not that there's some cabal that's making these decisions, but on the other hand, it's also very systematic. Dossiers are circulated uh, uh, that uh, are used to, to condemn and, and uh, make these false allegations and other kinds of discrediting of prominent people. That's Look, we'll one take, we'll, we'll, yeah, OK, and you had another point to make? Well, quickly, I'll make another point. Sure, just quickly. Uh, uh, one of the lines which the community are now taking is that why are we bellyaching so much about not getting coverage? Where, of course, we're getting quite a lot of coverage, and we're very pleased to see it. This is really also disingenuous because there's this outpouring now of response and explicitly on the uh, part of a large number of people, both Jews and non-Jews, is their relief at having been given the opportunity to express their dissent. I can give you dozens of emails, both from Jews and non-Jews, that just want to have their name on the uh, email list and when it doesn't work they keep uh, harassing us to make sure that the name is on there. This is an indication that there's some enormous uh, catharsis and an attempt for people to, to say, well, here I am and I want to sign my name to this. This is not just some sort of invention on our part and this is a symptom of of, of the kind of suppression and discouragement that, that we're, we're concerned about. Uh, De Vere, uh, perhaps you'd like to respond there to what Peter has said. I mean, at, at the very least, it does sound like this debate within the Jewish community, whilst it's uh, permitted to proceed, can get rather rancorous. Uh, first of all, it's interesting that he's used examples from the United States and not Australia. There are 120,000 Jews, uh, according to the statistics, living in Australia. So for those who are good at math, to make the calculations of 120 people, that's for what, 0.01%. Uh, so it, it, it's important to stress that point, that yes, they may get tens of emails, but it really still represents a slim minority of people. I just want to give really another a couple of examples because I'd like to talk about examples rather than talk in the general and talk about emails and, and, and examples in the States to talk about uh, Noam Chomsky or Finkelstein. These are more complex issues and to simply throw names up and again to uh, shame an entire community because of two or three examples is unfair. We have a, a, an annual event called Limud Oz. Limud means learning. And it's a festival of Jewish learning. There are hundreds of sessions with a rainbow of views, ideological stances, arguments, interpretations. I would argue that diversity and disagreement is encoded into the Jewish genes. The Jewish community is not about shutting anyone up. There are a multitude of ways that you can express alternative views. When the, the, when the IGV came out, the front page of the Jewish news featured IGV. Nobody is silencing anybody. When the Gaza uh, withdrawal took place in Israel two years ago, the Jewish community held a debate with two opposing teams arguing for and against their withdrawal. I was on the team arguing for. So really within the elected communal roof bodies that operate in Australia, there's a tremendous diversity of opinions and beliefs. Mm. Do we, I, look, I, I remember the last time that I sat in a room with other Jewish people and we agreed on anything. So um, if the signatories to the independent Jewish voices uh, are really concerned about Israeli policies and the Jewish community and their consequences, they should come and do something about this. They sure. should put their names up 
and they should ask their fellow Jews to elect them to the dem democratically elected bodies. I have to say uh, with all sincerity that I can't find any, and I have not witnessed any factual evidence to suggest that there's any silencing. And I think to suggest that there are dossiers and protocols and secret meetings about muffling people is quite offensive. Um, speaking with uh, Davira Abramovich, also we've uh, heard from Peter Slezak and Anthony Lowenstein, and uh, we're talking about uh, whether there is room for dissenting voices within the Jewish community. We'd love your views, 1300 22 55 76 or 1300 call RN, and uh, in line with the discussion this evening, we... Uh, Welcome, dissenting voices. Let's, uh, and shortly we'll actually, I should say, we'll uh, bring into the discussion Suzanne Rutland, who's uh, written uh, the definitive study of Australian jury to take a look at uh, whether or not the uh, traditions of debate within the Australian Jewish community um, permit the type of dissent that we're discussing this evening. Let's go to Vivian in Sydney. Hello, Vivian. Oh, hi there, Paul. Look, uh, um, I've been active as a Jew in um, peace activities um, between Israel and Palestine and um, locally with um, Palestinians and Jews for going on 20 years. And I have got some specific examples of the way Jewish officialdom does seek to silence alternate voices. Now, in the mid-90s, um, there was an overseas speaker coming to speak about Mordecai Vanunu, whom people will recall was the whistleblower who'd been um, in jail for uh, letting um, the world know about Israel's nuclear policies. And we had booked um, the Harkoa Club, a Jewish club in, in Sydney, and we'd paid our money a couple of weeks ahead and it was all fine. Two weeks before the uh, meeting was due, we were told that this was being cancelled. Uh, we were given our cheque uh, back and um, we were told that um, the Jewish local Jewish Board of Deputies in New South Wales had spoken to them and they did not feel that this was an appropriate um, debate to have in a, in a Jewish venue. Now, that's just one example. Mm -hmm. There have also been examples when, um, as um, Jewish peace activists, um, we'd been talking with the youth group, Habonim, and they'd been very keen to have us come along and talk and have a discussion with them about this. And then, closer to the time, it suddenly didn't happen. That wasn't going to happen now. And then there were two examples of that. And, um, you know, there's a whole, you know, th this example of um, that there was a debate whether, you know, withdrawal from Gaza was good or bad. It's the way the whole um, idea that there was a withdrawal from Gaza, they just drew to the edge. It's just a big prison instead of having the checkpoints in the middle. So it's Vivian, thanks for your call, Vivian. Need to move on. Plenty of people interested in this discussion today. And uh, let's go to Donna in Sydney now. Hi, Donna. Hi, um, I'm actually the woman who Margot was talking about who was called to the Consul General. Uh, I just want to say that I've, I've been a co-founder of an alternative voice um, in, in Sydney Jewry anyway for the past, past six years. We are very involved with Palestinians and um, dialogue groups with Muslims and Jews and as well as asylum seekers and all other things as well. I can't say that I've ever... Um, I had major problems with the mainstream Jewish community. I've also been a columnist in the Australian Jewish News for several years. Mm. I wrote um, about the rights of Palestinians. I wrote about um, the, the Israel's soul. I wrote all sorts of things. And although so clearly, Donna, you're writing the sort of stuff that some members of the Jewish community are not going to agree with. That's but, right. the, but the point is... You're permitted to write it, That's are you right. not? Exactly. And you're permitted That's to you're permitted to do so without being overly vilified. Is that what you're saying? In the Jewish news itself, I was allowed to write those things. And even though, yeah, there are people who get upset, I can't help but feel that this is the climate, general climate, of of our world. That fear and polarization. We didn't make that up, us Jews. That seems to be affecting the world. And but but people getting upset about. People getting upset about arguments, though, Donna, is is nothing new either. I mean, people have been getting upset about political discourse and arguments for <laughs> for time immemorial. That's my sense. That's my sense. And also, I think that dissenters are always the minority. They're always the ratbags until the mainstream begin to follow um, follow along. That's how it always happens. I yeah. don't see what the the big deal is about Jews, particularly silencing people. I find it, you know, I'm right there in the Jewish community, unlike Peter and Anthony. I work in the Jewish community. I teach. Everybody knows me and I'm an activist and I'm okay. <laughs> I yep. don't feel as if you know, I've got to pull down my blinds at night. No, it's good. Getting a range of views. Thanks Donna for expressing yours. Uh, let's stay in Sydney. Hello Irving. Hi. Uh, look, this is a really emotional topic for, for Jews in the community. 
Um, Israel is a Jewish country. Just about everybody in the community has got family in Israel and everybody is emotionally attached to it. As well as that, you have to take into account the fact that the Australian Jewish community has got one of the highest proportion of Holocaust survivors and their descendants of most communities in the world. Um, I'm a member of the Jewish, New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies. I happen to know Peter Slezak personally. Um, I have discussed matters with him. I was involved in the 90s in a left-wing Jewish group that advocated dialogue with the Palestinians and recognition and establishment of the Palestinian state before, uh, be before the Oslo Accords. And I just think it is a great tragedy, an absolute tragedy, that both Peter and Anthony Lowenstein, instead of wanting to debate the issues, um, as people like I have and people uh, like Donna have in the Jewish community, that they've now turned on the issue as being one where they're, they're, they're trying to denounce, uh, and I think in a completely unjustifiable way, uh, the Jewish community. The Jewish community is... You don't, you don't think they have a point? No, because the Jew, I mean, I, look, I was saying the sort of things that, that they've been saying, as, as Donna and other people have been saying it for years. Unfortunately, uh, neither Peter nor Anthony are people who have taken part in the debate, and they're, they're, they're people who have come in from the outside and have claimed to be martyrs to a certain cause, which I personally, I just, I just don't think it exists. There's debate in the Jewish community. I mean, my daughter goes to Habonim in Sydney. She was at uh, her, her senior camp, in January, and the debate was about Israel's Arabs, the problems they faced, and 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 about and about Israel's relations with with the Palestinians. Now, yep. that's not a uh, situation where people are told to shut up. I think that the problem is that when people such as uh, was well, people such as the ones we have who claim that the community is is, is officially trying to denounce them, um, that then then that they get they get a very negative response. And yes, I think, I think I think I think that's a great shame. Thanks for your call. This is uh, Australia Talks. I'm Paul Barclay and you're listening to ABC Radio National. This week's music show comes live and direct from Stage 1 at the Port Ferry Folk Festival. We'll have conversation and live music from Canadian bluegrass band The Mammals, guitar picker Dan Crary and melodeon player Riccardo Tessi with Band Italiana. Join me, Andrew Ford, for an all-singing, all-dancing music show from Port Ferry, Saturday morning at 10, Saturday evening at 8, here on ABC Radio National. Where we're discussing, uh, is there enough diversity of uh, Jewish voices presenting perspectives on the question of the Middle East? We'd love your views on Australia Talks 1300 22 55 76 or 1300 Call RN. We'll come to some more calls shortly. I'd like to introduce our next guest. Suzanne Rutland is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Hebrew, Biblical and Jewish Studies in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Sydney and among her many publications is a history of Australian Jewry called Edge of the Diaspora which was uh, released in 1988 and her current research interests include the sociology of Australia's Jewish community which includes the role of leadership. Suzanne, welcome to the program. Thank you. What's your observation about this debate and uh, uh, this debate about whether or not people are free within the Jewish community to express controversial views about the Middle East and where does it fit into the, the dynamics, if you like, of the Jewish community? Yes, um, if I could first give some historical background and then come to the findings of our present study, which I'm doing with Professor Sol Insull on the sociology of Australian Jewry, which very much um, deals with the issue of Jewish leadership within Australia. But firstly, it is important to recognise that Judaism has always had splits, very strong splits, uh, very often with acrimony, with tension. And so what we're seeing now is nothing new in Jewish history. Um, one can go back to Talmudic times and see the, rebate, the rabbinical debates in the Talmud. There's never one point of view. But if one looks at Australian Jewish history, perhaps a parallel is what happened in the 1940s with Sir Isaac Isaacs, perhaps one of the most prominent of Australian Jews in the history of um, our country, who becomes the first Australian-born Governor-General. Now, Sir Isaac Isaacs happened to be an extreme critic of Zionism and of the idea of creating a Jewish state. And he published his views vi widely in the general press, partly in the Jewish press, and indeed ended up sponsoring his own newspaper, which was published through Western Australia, the Australian Jewish Outlook, which was to uh, allow a voice 
for the anti-Zionist ar- ar- arguments of the time. Now, one of the great judicial international scholars again in Australia, Professor Julia Stone, then a very young professor at the University of Sydney, was the person who came to answer Sir Isaac Isaac's arguments and he wrote a pamphlet which was called Stand Up and Be Counted. Now, Mm. it was the same as now, incredible tensions on both sides and yet the main Jewish newspaper of the day, the Hebrew Standard, would publish week after week Sir Isaac Isaac's point of view in a column, half a page, and the other half a page was Julia Stone's responses. So, so, so Suzanne, would you, would, you, would you say then that this current debate doesn't represent any significant uh, difference from that type of debate that was happening uh, over 50 years ago? Or, or is there a, a generational change, uh, perhaps, perhaps a secular versus religious dynamic or, uh, or indeed uh, an old guard versus a new guard? Or, or, or is it just uh, it was always thus? I think that the issues are going to change. The issues today are not the issues of 60 years ago. But the fact that there is heated debate within the Jewish community is part of Jewish history. I mean, if you look back in Europe with the Hasidic movement when it emerged, the ultra-Orthodox Jews had key rabbis imprisoned by the Tsarist authority authorities because they opposed what those rabbis were saying. So this is Jewish history. And we had, a, I would support every word that Devere Abramovitz, Dr. Devere Abramovitz said, because I've also been deeply involved with the Australian Association for Jewish Studies. And we just had our conference on Jewish leadership. We had the wonderful Holocaust scholar here, Professor Yehuda Bauer, And Yehuda Bauer pointed out the diverse voices even in the Holocaust and said you cannot talk about Jewish leadership, you talked about Jewish leaderships because this ongoing tension and debate is part of Jewish history. And Mm. as Bauer argued, it's also the strength of Jewish history that there has been these tensions. And yes, there are people who very, very strongly, with great passion, oppose the type of arguments which Peter Schlesak and Anthony Lowenstein are putting. And that's because they're very committed to their beliefs within the community. And I So there's not, there's not, Suzanne, uh, from your research into uh, leadership and governance within Australia's Jewish community, some sort of monolithic Jewish leadership that is actively trying to stifle dissenting views? I I don't believe there is. I'm sure that there are a few powerful leaders who do try to steer the community. But as we've heard, both Anthony Lowe and Anthony has not been limited in what he's published, both within the Jewish press and outside. And certainly as an academic at the University of Sydney, I have never, ever felt, both in my position at the university and as three times president of the Australian Association for Jewish Studies, any sort of outside communal pressure. What's more, and I do want to mention the study which Sol and I are doing at present, where we are looking at Jewish communal leadership, and one of the questions has been the issue of democracy within the leadership. We have interviewed 10 groups across Australia in every city, looking at three lots of stakeholders, the youth, the women and the main leadership. And we've asked people to discuss what they see as major problems facing the community today. Out of those groups, over 150 people we've interviewed across Australia, no one but no one raised an issue of, you know, being suppressed. I am sure that Peter, when he talks about death threats, there probably are a couple of people within the community who feel so strongly that send such emails. But as Devere says, you cannot blacken the whole community because of a couple of individual people or even a, a, a group of individual people. Is it possible for me just to, uh, just to respond briefly to that, to what to Anthony, Anthony Lowenstein here, just very briefly. Um, I think there's been a bit of a um, misunderstanding here what... Um, Peter and I and indeed the Independent Australian Jewish Voices is trying to say or trying to do. Um, The Jewish community seems that their response has been in the last week and indeed before that is that um, we accept all views, we have open and frank debate and what are you people talking about? The simple fact is it's open and frank debate if you agree with what they're saying on Israel. On other issues it may be different. We're not talking about their views on Jewish welfare or 
Jewish poverty or Jewish drug use. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about Israel. And the simple fact of the matter is that if you speak up in those organisations, and I know numerous people who try to and have tried to do, they are shouted down. Now, we were told before by Mr Abramovich that we should be involved in the leadership. The fact of the matter is the vast majority of us have no interest in being involved in the Jewish leadership for one very, very simple reason. The simple reason is this, that... The leadership of this country has had decades and decades and decades to seriously address and respond to what Israel is doing, say, in the occupied territories or wherever it may be, or in Lebanon. And the simple fact is that now the Jewish community and indeed Israel itself is so internationally isolated, so supported by so few countries, and the Jews wonder why that might be. They might... Our position very much is to say we care deeply about Israel's future and indeed for the rights of the Palestinians for a homeland. The simple fact is that 40 years of occupation comes up this year, 40 years, and not one Jewish leader in this country will speak up and condemn the fact that the settlements are expanding. They're not decreasing, they're expanding. The settlements Mm. are getting larger and larger and larger, and yet people wonder why there's no peace. There's other reasons, of course, as well. Obviously, it's more complex than that. But the simple fact is the occupation is not ending. And to therefore say that there's diversity of views, yeah, there's diversity of views if you blindly accept everything Israel does. That is not diversity of views at all. Anthony, I need to come in. This is uh, Paul Barclay. You're listening to Australia Talks on uh, ABC Radio National where we have uh, many voices, including uh, the voice of Anthony Lowenstein, journalist and author. Also, you've heard from uh, Dr Susan Rutland, Devira Abramovich and also Dr Peter Slezak and we're discussing the issue of the diversity of views within Australia's Jewish community and I want to broaden the conversation somewhat and take it away from simply Australia's Jewish community for the moment uh, and bring into the discussion uh, Stephen Kirkasherian, the chair of the New South Wales Community Relations Commission. Now the CRC is a government body which promotes multiculturalism, cultural cultural diversity and uh, community unity. Stefan, welcome. It's a pleasure to be on your program. Uh, Stefan, obviously every community needs to uh, air its differences. Uh, This kind of debate, I would imagine, is not exclusive to the Jewish community. Well, uh, virtually all communities, uh, and that's not necessarily community in the ethnic, uh, specifically ethnic sense, I I think community in a more generic sense, uh, have got differences of opinion. From time to time these flare up, uh, become more emotional. Uh, But I have to say that, uh, by and large, uh, from my experience uh, dealing with various ethnic communities, there is a perception that uh, the the Jewish community has got it right in terms of community structures. Now, obviously, I don't know the inner workings uh, of the community. Uh, I say that because, uh, at least on a couple of occasions, uh, we have uh, sought uh, assistance from uh, the Jewish community uh, in uh, setting an example to a couple of other communities. One as recently as uh, three months ago with, with a community which I don't want to mention but which, which is having a lot of problems in adapting uh, to, uh, to, you know, in Australia to the circumstances here mm-hmm. where we had uh, the assistance of uh, some Jewish community leaders coming and speaking with the leadership of that community uh, giving them an idea of uh, how to structure a community. So there is a perception out there among uh, many communities that the structure, that, that the Jewish community somewhat has got the structure right. Uh, but as I said, differences of opinion will flare up. And uh, sometimes they will flare up in response to what is happening overseas and what is happening to the ancestral, ancestral homelands. Yes. And, and what role do you think the media has? Um, not so much the, uh, the ethnic specific media, but the mainstream media in, uh, in fermenting disa- dissent or debate uh, on these important issues? Well, I guess uh, the media uh, likes uh, conflict, uh, and I'm not saying that uh, uh, in any uh, negative sense. Uh, it, it seems that the media has to cater for its clientele and conflict uh, is always interesting, uh, but uh, it's a question of maintaining uh, balance and it's a question of... Uh, of uh, highlighting those which are uh, of more general interest rather than of a very narrow interest. This is Australia Talks on ABC Radio National 1322 55 76 is the number to call. Let's uh, head to Waldman in Sydney now. Hello, Waldman. How do you do? Uh, I'm a member of the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies and I've been one for about 25 years. And uh, Mr Lewiston is not unknown to us. 
particularly uh, for his zeal and uh, excess in identifying himself ex- almost exclusively with the Palestinian cause, whilst, of course, he is Jewish, generically, and uh, in some other respects. Uh, the problem Mr. Lohenstein has, not to the Jewish community, with the fact that his, the arguments he espouses within the Palestinian community and on behalf of the Palestinian community, I must add, extreme Palestinian community extremists, are not, of course, agreed by the Jewish community. Uh, he's been invited practically today by both David Noll and uh, Graham Leonard to join and the group, to join the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies and respectively the uh, Victorian Jewish uh, Board of Deputies. And as he said just a few minutes ago, he's not interested in that. He doesn't want to participate in a constructive manner in the Jewish forum of discussing issues that concern the Jewish community for which he reckons he re- in Israel, of course, uh, uh, he's passionate about. Uh, his problem is that he has failed a long time ago to identify himself with mainstream Jewish notions, and those are support for Zionism, which is extremely important to us, support mm-hmm. for the safety of Jews in Israel and outside Israel, and he's a, a very avid advocate for Palestinian causes to the extreme. That is well, then I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for expressing your view. I need to move through some other callers as time is upon us. Denise in Brisbane. Hello, Denise. Hello, Paul. Yes, I was just wondering why um, or how Anthony and Peter can say that they don't get a voice because actually I'm um, a Jew. Um, I'm not in any community. I'm uh, non-practicing, but I still consider myself Jewish and I actually get comfort out of the fact that Israel exists and is there and my cultural heritage has been regained. Um, But what I don't understand is um, how they think that they're not getting a voice. And also, um, I think this is more about their vilification than anything else. I mean, but, I mean, what, what can they expect with their anti-Zionist views and, you know, I mean, with Palestine not even accepting the state of Israel's existence yet? I mean, I really don't see what point they've got to say, make. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. Mm. Thanks, Denise. In Brisbane, that number again, 1300 55 76. Let's head to Dan in Sydney. Hello, Dan. Hello. Anthony said he's interested in open and frank debate, and that seems very noble, but I must say the number of times myself and others have submitted very civil comments to his blog with which he didn't, dis- with which he didn't agree and which he censored uh, make me suggest that he's good at dishing it out but not so good at taking it. Now, Anthony said in 2005 um, he's a Jew who doesn't believe in the concept of a Jewish state, and that's a direct quote. So... When he says a few minutes ago that he cares very deeply about Israel, you can see a double standard there and you can also imagine why a lot of his views are completely unpalatable to the community. However, nobody can deny that he's had more than enough opportunity to air it and unfortunately he's just not satisfied with that. Now, Peter Slezak said that uh, earlier in your program, critics of Israel get their heads chopped off. Now, I think that was a very unfortunate choice of words because I think you'll find chopping heads off uh, is the domain of another major religion. And we all know that in that religion, people who speak out, they are the ones who truly face oppression and victimisation. And if you speak to someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali uh, or the family of Theo van Gogh who was murdered for speaking out against Islam, you can see that uh, whilst they are convinced they're living in fear because of speaking out against the Jewish community, the reality Mm. is very different. Dan, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks to Dan in Sydney. If I can get a very quick response from Anthony Lowenstein to that, and Anthony, can you limit that to about 30 seconds, please? Of course I can. One thing I think, that's th- there's an attempt to try and frame this you know, independent Australian voices as a fringe group. What I think has not been mentioned tonight is the fact that the individuals actually who have got involved, we have a Dean of Law at Monash Law School, Ari Freiberg. We have Peter Singer. We have Louise Adler, who's publisher of a major Australian publisher. We have numerous other individuals across the political spectrum. The Jewish community tries to to frame this all about Anthony Lowenstein, the simple fact is that we're not talking about my book, we're talking about a group and different views, and the simple truth is that they are threatened, seriously threatened by the fact that there are numerous Jews from different perspectives who are speaking out and saying our voice should be heard. This is yep. not about me anymore, it's about a lot of other people as well.
Thanks, Anthony, for your time. Anthony Lowenstein, thanks also to Peter Slezak, to Stefan Kirkasherian, Devora Abramovich and uh, Susan Rutland. It's been uh, a really interesting discussion. We uh, didn't have time, I'm sorry, to uh, speak to David Knoll, the President of the Jewish Board of Deputies. We'd intended on uh, ringing up David but simply ran out of time uh, and also many people didn't get through. So please, uh, we'd love your emails on this one, abc.net.au slash rn. Go to Australia Talks and let's keep this discussion controversial as it is going uh, after the program finishes. So, uh, yes, uh, make sure you send us your uh, emails. Uh, That's it for uh, me for the day. And uh, make sure you stick around on ABC Radio National for some great uh, listening coming up, including Movie Time with Julie Rigg. I'll be back tomorrow. I'll speak to you then. You've been listening to another ABC Radio National podcast. ABC Radio National, on air and online, with many of our programs available as podcasts or MP3 downloads. All the details at abc.net.au slash rn slash podcast.